so hello everybody um thank you elizabeth and adeline and jane for helping me organize this this um, annual meeting so thank you very much so the first thing to say is this is not a lecture but rather it's a seminar in which i want to facilitate a discussion of dickinson's reading and response to antony and cleopatra and othello the title of this session alludes to Dickinson's participation in a Shakespeare reading club in Amherst in the, early, in the early 1850s. The club included tutors and students from Amherst College, the Dickinson siblings, and many of Dickinson's female friends. More specifically, the seminar's title references an incident of attempted censorship where male tutors attempted to protect their female tutees from Shakespeare's wickedness. Today's seminar, however, is less about censoring Shakespeare and more about discussing why these plays were controversial throughout Dickinson's lifetime and why her references to these plays may have shocked her contemporaries. If Antony and Cleopatra and Othello were to be read aloud in this mixed company, they would certainly have to be heavily censored. To convey some of the problems that these plays posed, I will refer to the most influential and widely available expurgated 19th century edition of Shakespeare, The Family Shakespeare, edited by Harriet and Thomas Bowdler. What is removed and changed in this edition from Antony and Cleopatra and Othello provides us with an indication of some of the words and passages from these plays that were most offensive to 19th century tastes and least appropriate for family reading. So I'll begin by reminding you of what happened at Dickinson's Shakespeare Club before turning first to Antony and Cleopatra and then to Othello. So we'll consider some of the scenes from these two plays that were most important to Dickinson based on her letters and markings in her edition of Shakespeare. The Houghton Library in Harvard has helpfully digitized the eight volume edition of Shakespeare's works that Dickinson used, which is edited by Charles Knight. So we can examine and you can examine the markings and homemade bookmarks in these plays that I'm going to be discussing. So I plan to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes and then I'll invite your comments and your reflections on what I've said so that you can be part of this Shakespeare reading club. Before discussing the plays, let me remind you of what happened when the tutors from Amherst College attempted to censor the reading of Shakespeare in 1851. So Lavinia, Dick Lavinia Dickinson kept a diary in 1851, and it offers much information about the sisters' social activities in Amherst during this year. Lavinia notes that they had a reading circle, which first met on an evening in March and had its final meeting in July. The circle included at various points all three of the Dickinson siblings, and it was coordinated by male tutors and students from Amherst College. The club included Dickinson's female friends, Susan Gilbert, the poet's future sister-in-law, Marta Gilbert, Sue's sister, Mary Warner, and also Emily Fowler. In Emily Fowler, Fowler Ford's reminiscences of Dickinson, this reading circle is a Shakespeare club, and she recorded the following for Mabel Loomis Todd. We had a Shakespeare club, a rare thing in those days. And one of the tutors proposed to take all the copies of all the members and mark out the questionable passages. This plan would negative at the first meeting, as far as the girls spoke, who said they did not want the strange things emphasized, nor their books spoiled with marks. Finally, we told the men to do as they liked. We shall read everything. I remember the lofty air with which Emily took her departure saying, there's nothing wicked in Shakespeare. And if there is, I don't want to know it. The men read for perhaps three meetings from their expurgated editions and then gave up their plan. And the whole text was read out boldly. Two entries in Lavinia's diary may identify the time this attempted censorship occurred. On June 10th, Lavinia says, Howland called, that's one of the tutors, attended reading society, did not enjoy it at all. Howland came home with me. 
Three days later, she writes, Emily Fowler spent morning reading Shakespeare here. So in Fowler Ford's account, Dickinson and her friends don't want to know which Shakespeare passages were inappropriate. This well-known anecdote about Dickinson is an example of her defiance, her independence of thought and her self-assurance, and also the defiance and self-assurance and independence of thought of her friends, her female friends. However, it seems Dickinson and her friends were well aware of many objectionable words and passages in Shakespeare's works. The incident highlights Shakespeare's complex position in her culture. Dickinson read Shakespeare at a time when he was regarded by some as a wicked writer whose works needed to be censored. For others, Shakespeare was a highly moral writer whose works were required reading for all. Anxiety about women's reading Shakespeare was part of a much wider unease about what and how women read and how to preserve female respectability, morality, purity, while encouraging female cultivation. This episode reminds us that in Dickinson's era, reading Shakespeare was not just a silent, solitary activity, but a public and social practice that involved skill. At school, during her rhetoric lessons, Dickinson, as well as many of the other members of the Shakespeare Club, would have been taught how to read aloud. By all accounts, Dickinson was a very good reader. Contemporary rhetoric books used at Amherst Academy and Mount Holyoke, which Dickinson attended, advised the reader to make his or her voice conform to the sentiment being conveyed the voice should become an external sign of the inner states of the characters being read. One leading rhetorician, Richard Watley, whose works Dickinson studied, advised that the reader should strive to adopt as his own and as his own at the moment of utterance every sentiment he delivers and to say it to the audience in the manner which the occasion and subject spontaneously suggest to him who has abstracted his mind both from all consideration of himself and from the consideration that he is reading. So Shakespeare Club members would not have read scenes aloud unless they had studied and fully understood what they were reading. To convey a character's emotions was paramount and so readers were encouraged to subordinate punctuation and even black to the need even expression. Readers were advised to intersperse their reading with pauses and moments of silence, if that was appropriate to capture a given character's emotional state. This context explains why the male tutors sought to mark certain passages from Shakespeare's works. It was not just about club members reading offensive passages aloud, the tutors knew that to read such passages effectively, female tutees would need to understand characters, passages and words that these men deemed distasteful. Although Edward Dickinson worried about and sought to influence his daughter's readings, he did not seem to view Shakespeare's works as the type of book that might joggle his daughter's mind. In 1857, rather than purchasing an expurgated or bowdlerized edition of Shakespeare's works, he chose Knight's uncensored 1853 edition. So let's now turn to the plays. Based on the critical reception of Antony and Cleopatra, it seems to me very unlikely that Dickinson's Shakespeare Club would have read Antony and Cleopatra given its focus on adultery and lust. The play's central characters were widely regarded as morally reprehensible, and Cleopatra was regarded by contemporary commentators as the prototype of female seductiveness and wantonness. The Bowdler's family Shakespeare expurgated numerous words, phrases and entire passages that relate to Cleopatra's sexuality and to Antony and Cleopatra's sex life. The sexual language used freely by Cleopatra's company 
Charmerman, Alexis, Iris, Mardian, are removed, as are the play's many references to drunkenness and its many jokes about male anatomy and cuckold. It is difficult to imagine Dickinson not noticing the often highly sexual language of the play. References to Antony and Cleopatra in Dickinson's letters suggest she, were, she was particularly attracted to Anna Barbus's description of Antony's first meeting Cleopatra. Dickinson incorporated the lines and for his ordinary pays his heart for what his eyes eat only, into letters to Susan Dickinson and to her nephew Ned. Here's the full speech for Anna Barbus. Upon her landing, Antony sent to her, invited her to supper. She replied, it should be better he became her guest, which she entreated, our courteous Antony, whom ne'er the word no woman heard speak. Being barbered ten times o'er goes to the feast and for his ordinary pays his heart for what his eyes eat only. Although Dickinson's edition retains it, most contemporary expurgated versions of the play remove the final line of Agrippa's reply to Enobarbus. He plowed her and she cropped. So the full line is royal wench. She made great Caesar lay his sword to bed. He plowed her and she cropped. Again, my point is that Dickinson's contemporaries were troubled by the play's often crude and blunt representations of human sexuality. So when Dickinson tells her cousin Joseph Lyman that Antony and Cleopatra was the first play she read after her period of eye trouble, her choice is a very provocative one. Dickinson's edition of Shakespeare contains a fate mark beside a line from Antony's speech where he reprimands Cleopatra for not realizing that he would inevitably follow her retreat during the Battle of Actium. And sorry, I should have explained that the pages and the images that you see, they're from actually Dickinson's version, her, her version of Antony and Cleopatra. So that's what you're seeing on the slides. That's what you saw on the previous slide. Um, they are from the Harvard's um, digitization of Antony and Cleopatra. So I don't know whether you can see it, but there's a sort of a faint line beside Egypt thou newest, if you can see that. So Dickinson's edition contains this faint mark and the lines are, Egypt thou newest too well. My heart was to thy rudder tied by the strings and thou shouldst tow me after or my spirit, thy full supremacy, thou newest that thy beak might from the bidding of the gods command me. Dickinson sent Egypt down newest as a single note to Sue and incorporated it in a letter to Mabel Loomis Todd. Scholars such as Judith Farr, Paula Bennett, Martin L. Smith have demonstrated that Dickinson's love for this play is connected with her passionate relationship with her sister-in-law, Susan Dickinson. But given the reception of the play at this time, I think Dickinson's contemporaries would have been shocked that Dickinson connected or seemed to connect her and her sister-in-law Sue's relationship with that of Antony and Cleopatra. Dickinson's contemporaries would have been surprised, perhaps even appalled, that a woman would identify with either of these immoral characters. But perhaps Dickinson needed a powerful, sensuous play, such as Antony and Cleopatra, and its iconic figures to capture the drama and passion of her relationship with Sue. Now, if you look at the slides, I'm showing you now homemade bookmarks in Dickinson's edition of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, which indicate that Dickinson was not merely interested in Antony and Cleopatra's passion, but also in their death scenes. Antony's death scene and Cleopatra's decision to commit suicide may have had very special importance for Dickinson. So pages 516 and 517 contain Antony's death scene. And they have this piece of pink string that you can see carefully enclosed between them. Now what's very provocative is that the string begins on pages 
384 and 385 in another play, Julius Caesar. So this is the show you. This is very provocative. Is Dickinson using this pink string to connect the great hero of the earlier play, Julius Caesar, with the now pitiable and ignoble man who fails to kill himself fully and dies in Cleopatra's monument, into which he has been humiliatingly raised by Cleopatra and her women? In addition, throughout Antony's death scene, Cleopatra continually interrupts Antony. So for example, he says, I'm dying Egypt, dying only. I have important debt a while until of many thousand kisses, the poor last I lay on thy lips. And then he says, I'm dying Egypt, dying. Give me some wine and let me speak a little. But Cleopatra says, no, let me speak. So, Dickinson seems to be connecting this dying Antony, who's humiliated, who's lost all his honor, with the great orator of Julius Caesar, the man who gave us friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. The bookmark is intriguing as Dickinson interconnects Antony's famous friends, Roman and countrymen speak a staple of 19th century rhetorical lessons with his tragic speechlessness and his sense of personal dishonor. A triangular shaped piece of brown material was clearly enclosed for some time and has stained pages 528 and 529, which depict Cleopatra's preparations for her own death scene. The brown material has stained the scene where Caesar assures Cleopatra that he will not, as she fears, hoist her up and show her to the shouting valetry of censuring Rome. He tells her, Caesar's no merchant to make prize with you of things that merchants sold. But Cleopatra knows Caesar is lying. She knows that if she will be taken and turned into an Egyptian puppet, she is horrified by the idea that mechanic slaves with greasy aprons, rules and hammers shall uplift us to the view in their thick breaths, rank of gross diet, shall we be enclouded and forced to drink their valor, sorry, their vapors. Cleopatra's suggestion of the commercial exploitation leads to one of Shakespeare's most famous metatheatrical moments as Cleopatra imagines how she will be represented on stage. Saucy liquors will catch us at us like strumpets and scald rhymers ballad us out of tune. The quick comedians extemporally will stage us and present our Alexandrian rebels. Antony shall be brought drunken fort, and I shall see some squeaking Cleopatra boy my greatness in the posture of a whore. Cleopatra declares that she will conquer their most absurd intents uh, through suicide. She, she tells Charmian, show me my women like a queen, go fetch my best attires. I'm again for sinness to meet Mark Antony. Sarah, Iris, go, now noble Charmian, we'll dispatch indeed. And when thou hast done thy char, I'll give thee leave to play till doomsday. These homemade bookmarks suggest that Dickinson was drawn to this play's depictions of enduring passion and heartbreaking loss, but also to these final scenes in which Antony and Cleopatra struggle to control their own self mythologization. She seems interested in the keen link between Antony's journey between honor in Julius Caesar and dishonor in the play Antony and Cleopatra, and in Cleopatra's determination to control her own ending and orchestrate her place in history. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to Othello. Now, Othello is the most marked play in Dickinson's edition of Shakespeare. It's also the play that Dickinson refers to most often in her letters. Although Dickinson's Shakespeare Reading Club may have tackled this play during its existence, again, as I will explain, there are many problems with reading this play 
in an uncensored version. So again, what you're seeing on the screen are um, cut from Dickinson's version of the play and you can see her marks. So the first marking in Dickinson's edition of Othello occurs on the right-hand side of Brabantio's reluctant parting with his daughter, where he tells Othello, I hear to give thee that with, my with all my heart, which but thou hast already, with all my heart, I would keep from thee. Dickinson incorporates this quotation into letters to Maria Whitney and to Thomas Wentworth Higginson. From the same scene, Dickinson also quotes from the Duke of Venice's response, the robbed that smiles steals something from the thief. He robs himself that spends a bootless grief. Dickinson included this quotation in letters to Catherine Sweetser and to Helen Hunt Jackson. Interestingly, Dickinson also marks another line, which you can see here, um, that relates to theft and robbery, expressed by Othello himself in Act Three. The lines read, he that is robbed, not wanting what is stolen, let him not know it, and he's not robbed at all. So you can see here where Dickinson has marked this in Act Three of the play. However, the theme of robbery and theft is racialized and sexualized from the beginning of Othello. The play opens with Iago and Rodrigo shouting outside Barbantio's house about a robbery that has taken place. Iago shouts, even now, now, very now, an old black ram is thumping your white yo. Iago tells him, you'll have your daughter covered with a Barbary horse. And as well, your daughter and the moor are now making the beast with two backs. Needless to say, such passages relating to Othello and Desdemona's sexual relationship and its racial inflections were far too explicit for family reading and were removed from Bowdler's family's Shakespeare. These are exactly the scenes the Amherst tutors would have sought to censor. Another passage from Act One, Scene Three is marked in Dickinson's edition of Othello where Desdemona demands that she be allowed to accompany Othello to um, Cyprus. Here is the full speech. That I did love the Moor to live with him, my downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet it to the world, my heart subdued even to the very quality of my Lord. I saw Othello's visage in the, his mind, and to his honor and his valiant parts did I my soul and fortunes consecrate, so that, dear lords, if I be left behind a moth of peace and he go to war, the rights for which I love him are bereft me, and I, a heavy interim, shall support by my dear absence. Let me go with him. Now I've placed a yellow mark beside the line that's expurgated from all versions of the play, such as Bowdler's Family Shakespeare, the rights for which I love him are bereft me, because of course it has sexual connotations that underscore Desdemona's sexual desire. So again, we see Dickinson marking it, but this very passage that she marked contains this quite um, explicit reference, or at least was seen as explicit at, at, at the time. Given the sexual and racial aspects of the play and Othello's subsequent murder of his wife, Desdemona, it seems highly controversial that Dickinson suggestively identifies her own experiences of loss and jealousy in letters to three of her female friends. All three notes are humorous and clearly Dickinson uses Othello as a shorthand for jealous possessiveness. However, Given th these references um, that I've, I've pointed out to you, these, these sexualized, racialized references, it's very striking that Dickinson should identify with Othello in these three letters. So I'm just gonna read them for you and remind you of them. So Dickinson wrote the following to Sarah Jenkins. 
who was the who was the wife of the former pastor of the first church of Amherst and who had just left recently Amherst to, to go to Pittsburgh with her family. To convey how much she misses her friend, Dickinson writes, I hope you are each safe. It is homeless without you. And we think of others possessing you with the throes of Othello. In an 1884 letter to Elizabeth Holland that congratulates her on the birth of her grandchild, Dickinson again identifies with Othello. Feeling that Mrs. Holland's love and attention would be taken away by the birth of her grandchild, Dickinson says that she will try to bear it as divinely as Othello did, who had he had love's sweetest slice would not have charmed the world. In autumn 1884, in a letter to Maria Whitney, who's away at the time, Dickinson uses Othello to express her own jealousy. Has the journey ceased or is it still progressing? And has nature won you away from us as we feared she would? Othello is uneasy, but then Othello's always are. They hold such mighty stakes. In an 1885 letter to Mabel Loomis Todd, who was in the midst of an affair with her brother, with Dickinson's brother Austin, the poet seems to justify the experience of jealousy by referencing God's own covetousness. Why should we censure Othello when the criterion lover says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? Okay. So my research suggests that while Dickinson's female contemporaries frequently identified with Shakespeare's tragic heroes, for example, Hamlet and Romeo, no, no other woman that I've located in the 19th century identifies with Othello. Perhaps new research has emerged that will contradict this claim. But for me, Dickinson is using Othello as an extreme example of otherness, to speak of that which she would not want found in herself, and that may hint at aspects of herself she regarded as unorthodox. However, I would like to bring my contribution to this seminar to an end by referencing another letter, which again reminds us of Dickinson's concern with questions of reputation, honor, and how one's life ends. In a letter to Judge Otis Lord, Dickinson writes, Oh, my too beloved, save me from the adultery, sorry, from the idolatry, which would crush us both. And very see, mark of my utmost sale. Dickinson refers here to the climactic final scene of Othello. The final scene is heavily marked in Dickinson's copy of Othello, suggesting Dickinson's interest in how Desdemona and Othello died. Again, Dickinson's reference to Othello and her markings in the play return us to questions of honor and reputation. Having rediscovered that Iago has, uh, sorry, having discovered that Iago has tricked him into murdering his faithful and beloved Desdemona, Othello tells his uncle Graziano that the only thing left to him is to die. The only way he can find honor is true death. He says, be not afraid, though you do see me weaponed. Here is my journey's end. Here is my butt and very sea mark of my utmost sail. Do you go back dismayed? Tis is a, a loss fear. Man but a rush against Othello's breast and he retires. Where should Othello go? And at that moment, usually Othello will, will kill himself. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And that sort of completes my contribution to our um, seminar. So I would be very interested to hear your reaction, your feedback, your ideas, and um, I'll take notes. So, so you can, yeah, you can, you can ask, uh, you can raise your hand or you can unmute. So, so I see um, Felis, Felicia. Felicia Nimiwakun. Uh, yes, um, I, I had a five minute Zoom problem. So I apologize in advance if I ask about something you've already touched on. 
but in what I heard, this did not arise. I wonder what you'd like to say about the relation between Othello and one of my favorite Emily Dickinson poems. Had I not seen the sun, I could have borne the shade, but light and newer wilderness my wilderness hath made, and how that applies to jealousy. Um, I, I, okay, I, I, I would have to, I'd have to get that, the poem in front of me because I, 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 could you, because, because really this is more about you telling me. So what, what, what will you tell me what you think? My immediate thought is that while life is bearable without love, that is without having seen the sun, once you are in love with someone and you discover or think you discover that the person has betrayed you, it's much more unbearable because you know what happiness is and now it's gone. And that seems to me to apply to Othello. That's brilliant. That's 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 wonderful. I, I I think I think you're right. I think you're right. That 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 makes that makes sense. So could you just tell me the name of the poem again? Um, in the first line, which is how they're normally listed, is "Had I not seen the sun." Yes. And the I, whole poem again. It's short, so I could just say it. Had I not seen the sun, I could have borne the shade, but light a newer wilderness my wilderness hath made that's brilliant that's yes i see what you mean so there's a kind of a there's a sort of a sense of of the way in which one can change one's in, entire vision and um, both through loving somebody but then also becoming jealous about them that's what i had in mind yes thank that's, you that's that's brilliant i i i'm, I'm sorry um I, I don't have my copy of, of Dickinson's complete poem. So I, and she's got so many poems. I did, I couldn't, I couldn't quite remember that one. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Eliza. Hi, Perrick. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful. And so, um, deeply informative. I really admire the, um, the care and knowledge, um, that you've, you you spent obviously spent a lifetime working on these these ideas and thoughts. Um, so you stress desire in in your readings uh, of Othello. I'm sorry about my dog. I, I can't. Uh, <laughs> she wants to walk with me, so she's she may bark. Um, she doesn't like it when I'm on the computer. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you stress desire, and then. Um, and this may I'm, this might bring in Adeline as well. Um, I'm I'm wondering about the racial implications of identifying with Othello, because recent readings of Dickinson, uh, of course, explore her uh, her um, kind of fear of blackness or her inability to empathize with black people. Um, and yet here she is identifying uh, with Othello, but I'm not hearing the, well, Othello is, it's important that he's black in the 19th century and in the, in the play um, and exotic in some way. Uh, I'm wondering how that might emerge or how you see that emerging um, even, and if she, had, if she, somehow draws attention to it even obliquely. And I'm wondering about Adeline's proto uh, partial voices as well, um, or emergent voices, whether they appear unmarked there. That's kind of a complex question. <laughs> Just wondering about blackness uh, in Dickinson's identification with Othello. That, that, that's a great that's a great question, Eliza. Um, so so how, how I would answer it is that there's this Italian actor called Tommaso Salvini, and he was probably the mo became the most famous Othello of the period. So Austin attended um, um, performances by Salvini. And I think what he gave um, audiences was a, a sort of um, I suppose a nationally different other and an Italian. But, but not the kind of um, darker skinned other that may have been more problematic. However, at the time, I mean, um, um, there were actors, um, African-American actors, uh, such as uh, Ida Aldridge, who, who were playing um, uh, Othello and, and became very, very famous, particularly in, in, in Europe, in, 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 um, 
in in London and in and in the UK and in Ireland as well. So um, so I think um, it, it's it's such a that's such a complicated question um, in, in a way to, to answer it. But what I would say is that most of Dickinson's references to Othello occur after. Austin has seen Salvini after Dickinson ha per perhaps has read about Salvini and knows about Salvini. And in those letters, I was a little bit sneaky. I cut out the references that Dickinson explicitly makes to Salvini. So to answer your question, what I would say is that Dickinson is more comfortable identifying with Othello because I think she links him to an Italian actor called Tommaso Salvini, who's playing it around the time that Dickinson is... Um, Relating, you know, and, and actually Tommaso Salvini uh, gave his performances in Italian, not in, in English. So, so, so that would be my, my answer. But, but maybe Adeline, you'd like to come in and, 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 and talk about your, your idea about breaking up the, the speakers and, and, and creating different sort of um, disjunctions within voice. Yeah, I think also it has to do with uh, Othello being performed in blackface. Uh, on American stages um, during the time. And that necessarily creates a disjunction um, in the, the character of Othello, who is uh, white and not white, you know, black but not black. Um, and um, yeah, the, the reference to Salvini is also very important. I think it, it has to do with her representation of otherness and how she represents otherness in racial terms most of the time. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that there's a lack of empathy towards Black people because like very often in the poems about frustration, um, you know, like uh, tigers moaning for a drink or you know, with the, the representation of the berry, which is really racialized. Um, right, right. but the, I'm talking more about the critical readings um, that have really, uh, and one could understand, one understands that in this time period, that's what, I mean, in this contemporary time period, that's what's bring, being brought out. Mm -hmm. But even the, the berry or the tiger deeply estranges and dehumanizes um, the African-American, a berry is edible, for example, and um, the, the image of a person as a berry is a, is a bit grotesque, mm. um, a bit. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so with Othello, his blackness in, in the text is stressed anyway, mm. uh, Perak. Uh, and so, and I would think, and you've stressed Dickinson's reading of the text itself, as well as the performances of the period. So, um, it seems interesting. I like what you're saying, Adeline, that there's a theatrical distancing in some yeah. way that that would allow a form of identification that um, you don't see elsewhere. So thank you. I don't want to take up more time, but um, it's, it's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. And Barbara. Thank you. Um, I'm going to put down my hand. It seemed to me, it made perfect sense uh, when you were talking that she would identify with Othello, and Adeline was just mentioning this, as other, because in her position that we would say today of white privilege and so on, what, what is so striking is that she always identifies with, with people in her society who, who suffer because they're the wrong identity. She's imprisoned, you know, she's caged, uh, she's, she's starving, she's homeless, uh, she's, she's the other, she is the foreigner, she's the despised, she's the one who can't get into heaven. Uh, she sang too loud, um, that she consistently identifies with an other who is oppressed, suppressed, despised, and unworthy. And I feel it is so striking, her explicit identification in her letters, as you point out brilliantly, that she's Othello, 
perhaps the most kind of oppressed and other and taboo in her culture. And she's just out with it. Yes, that's who I am. So I think that you are making a brilliant contribution here uh, to our understanding uh, of her reading of Shakespeare. Thanks very much, Barbara. That, that's that's really really helpful. And 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 you're right. I mean, that's the other side of that. You know, if we if we emphasize race, um, we kind of forget that that um, Othello is is hoodwinked by Iago. He is the victim, and he, as you say, is the ultimate um, oppressed figure. And and that 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 is very very interesting. Thanks very much, Barbara. Um, Li Xing. Hi. Um, thank you for this great talk and. I'm thinking about what the dis your, your discussion with Adeline earlier about how Dickinson has this lyrical voice of sort of emptying herself. It's a bit like Keatsian capability. And I feel like in this talk, you also talk about that at the very beginning of how like readers should be trained to be emptying themselves and forget their reading. Um, but then towards the end, you also talk about this, the other way she uses those voice to those voices to express herself. So on the one hand, you have her uh, in a way, like losing herself in the lyrical voice. On the other hand, you have this borrowing of other voices to emphasize her own identity or the otherness in herself that's not easily identifiable not through those dramatic voices. So I'm just wondering, like it's just seemed to me there are those two directions and two forces there. Probably both are present in her poems. I just wonder what you have. Do you have any thoughts on that? I just wish I'd written that. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant, Li Xing. That that's that's amazing. Yes, because one of the things that um, I think we 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 forget that Dickinson was trained um, to to read and to read aloud. And one of the, the the pieces of advice, which which I read out, is that you have to forget yourself. That if you want to be a successful reader, you have to forget who you are, and you have to act or perform, not act as in with, with your hands, but you act with your voice. And mm -hmm. you need to convey that, that those sentiments. And Dickinson was trained to do that. But yet, as you say, Dickinson also uses that voice, that voice of Othello, the lines of Othello, to incorporate uh, you know, into her messages about herself, her, her jealousy, her, her loss of somebody, um, and, and I think that that's beautifully put. So, so thank you. That, that's, and, and that connects so well with, as you say, um, Adeline's paper about the lyric voice and, and these different things that Dickinson can include in that lyric voice and the way Dickinson expands, you know. And I think, Adeline, just to come back, you're, you're spot on with Keats. You know, Keats talks about negative capability, but maybe he doesn't explore it in the way that Dickinson does. So, so, um, so yeah, thank you very much, Li Xing. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Anne. Anne. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk, though I was quite alarmed at first, thinking that you were going to say everything I was going to say. Uh, you explained about the boundaries and the family Shakespeare, but I just want to comment. I wanted to, I'm going to be exploring tomorrow afternoon the the Knight's edition of Shakespeare and his editorial apparatus, his commentary and introduction to Othello and to some of the other plays. And I was fascinated that we have here not only Dickinson's markings, but we have a potential influence on her poetry through Knight's um, comments and introductions to the plays, which of course would have influenced other contemporaries. And I am very interested in how that plays into the discussion of Othello's race and so on. And I just wanted to say that uh, you, you focused more on the, um, the actual quotations that she marks and where she echoes them in her letters. And I'm working off the, the other material material in Knight's book and also off of poems that reflect, that could reflect uh, her absorption with Othello. So uh, 
thank you again for all you have all your work on Shakespeare. It's been a real inspiration. Thanks, and, thanks very much. And and I think the, the Houghton Library deserve a lot of credit for digitizing everything. I mean, when I did it, I had to go in and um, beg to have access to Shakespeare's edition. And now it's it's all online. So it's it's absolutely brilliant. And you can look at the bookmarks that I've shown you, shown you. So um, I, I think we're, we're gonna try to, to wrap this up. So we've got two more, more questions. So Antoine and Ivy. So so maybe Antoine, if, if, if you'd like to go, go first, uh, please. Yeah, it's a quick question. Quick, Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, it's a textual detail really. Um, thinking back to the poem that Adeline uh, analyzed in her talk, uh, The Tempest Poem, I was wondering if the in the last stanza, the reference to the monster, in connection with the eyes on the same line, you remember, um, mm -hmm. the, the monster's faded eyes, if that could be in any, in any way a reference to um, the, the green eye monster of mm -hmm. jealousy in Othello, and how then, if that was the case, then the Tempest scene would also be a jealousy scene in, of some sort or and you know in the last stanza suddenly um peace returns after this bout or this anxiety about jealousy but the, i don't know if you see it that way but i was just wondering if that made any sense to you Porik and adeline as well I, well well i i i'll just just quickly say because because adeline will know more about that poem but but just to say yes um, Adeline's illuminated that poem. I, I've never thought about it in relation to Shakespeare. I've never thought about it in relation to The Tempest, which I should have. Um, but what you're saying about that, the idea of the green eyed monster, and then almost having to pass through that stage to reach paradise, which is exactly what happens to yeah. us at the end. So that's brilliant, Antoine. I, I'll move over to, to Adeline. Maybe Adeline would like to say a bit more. Um, yeah, definitely. I think it, and you know, Caliban is also jealous throughout the, the play, so it makes total sense. And, but mostly it's, what, it, what strikes me is that very often uh, Dickinson uses uh, an Africanist alter ego to express jealousy. And remember that the Malay took the pearl ends also with reunion, a like to him one. Um, so there is this, this temptation to, um, to, to unite with this, this dark author that is a projection um, for, for jealousy. And I was thinking of another poem, um, Though My Destiny Be Fustian, um, in which uh, the speaker represents herself as a gypsy uh, in opposition to a white woman. Um, so very often the lyric self appears in blackface, you could say, in, in scenes of jealousy and um, like in The Malay Took the Pearl as well, um, which is also in, in the Othello poem. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much. Um, uh, Ivy. Uh, yeah, thank you, Parak. That was really, really fun and, and, and terrific. Um, and I, and I know that um, you pointed out there's a, Dickinson pays a lot of attention to the suicide scenes, the death scenes. And I think there's gonna be a talk later on in this, um, uh, in the conference on, on suicide. Um, but it, all, it also seems to me that when she quotes or, or misquotes Othello and, and, and Shakespeare in general in her letters, it's often funny, it's often tongue in cheek, it's often, a little show offy. It's so I'm wondering if you could talk about the, 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 the way she uses it to kind of make a kind of joke in a way, um, even though she, what she's referring to are these kind of death scenes, but it seems to me it's part of her humor as well. Yeah, I mean that 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 that's that's spot on. I mean, I think Dickinson is is probably one of the the funniest writers, particularly particularly in her letters. And you're right, she incorporates um, quite difficult, tragic um, information in, into, and, and, and I mean, I didn't refer to it, but there's a couple of ones where she compares a, a dying flower to Hamlet or a dying flower to um, Desdemona. And on one level, it's kind of, 
she's trying to maybe create the same level of tragedy for for the flower and, and to give it um, a kind of a, a Shakespeare Shakespearean um, authority or power. But at the same time, she's kind of almost bringing Shakespeare down a level, you know, and and one of the things that, that I, I link that to is the burlesque. So there were lots of burlesques of Shakespeare at the time where lots of people put together amusing um, uh, sort of uh, combinations of plays and different characters. And I think Dickinson does that in her letters. So so for for me, I think you're you're spot on. It's it's comic. It's it's not just about um, kind of elevating her flower, but it's also about kind of almost bringing Shakespeare down to a kind of more domestic level. And I think that that's what the burlesques did. These burlesques were performed at Amherst College in, in the 1870s, around the same time as Dickinson is is sending out these letters to the world. So I, I think. Definitely, she's. I think she's burlesquing and, and and making fun of and bringing down this highly elevated Shakespeare, while at the same time, you know, um, sort of elevating these lower uh, things that are happening in 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 her world. So, so thank you very much, Ivy. Um, Bewa, have you got? Uh, hi, uh, Parik. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, both you and uh, Ad Adeline uh, didn't mention Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, maybe you, you don't, you didn't have much time to talk about this topic, but I think it's quite related to what you are talking about, and also what Adeline uh, talked about uh, Dickinson's uh, uh, identity and the. the uh, gender reversal also. So uh, I, I think uh, if you uh, are interested in mention a little bit about this, uh, uh, what, what do you think about this? Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be just very, very brief um, because I, I'm conscious that we want to, we've got um, Martinelle's uh, session coming up at 11.20 um, Amherst time. Um, so I want to give people maybe, so, so I'll just very, so we can leave, will, 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 we, will we stop maybe at 10 past? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just very quickly. So I've, I've written about the sonnets and I, I do agree about the, the gender bending and, and, and all of that. Um, I think the, Dickinson does, does it very well and she draws on, you know, Shakespeare's queering of, of language and, and, then, and then uses that. Um, so I've, I've written about that back in 2008, so I've kind of probably forgotten, <laughs> but, but, um, but maybe Adeline has, has more recently taught about this than me with regard to the sonnets. Yeah, actually I didn't work a lot with the sonnets because I was mostly interested in the connection between the theatre and the lyric, uh, and so that made more sense for me to, to work with the plays than with the sonnets. Um, but yeah, definitely the, 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 there are tons of um, links to be drawn with the sonnets because for example, I um, can't remember the first line, but uh, I think it's, um, I think I was enchanted. The one where, where she refers to Barrett Browning as a dark lady. Um, that really could be read as a reference to the dark lady in the sonnets, you know, that, that mysterious, attractive figure. Um, and of course, uh, as Parik was saying, that the, all the gender reversals and, and the figure of the youth, the boy, uh, who is a figure of transition. Thank you. I've just realized that there's, there's some questions in the chat. So um, maybe I'm just going to take two minutes very, very quickly to... So thank you all for your lovely comments here. So I've been so busy talking to people on the screen. I haven't looked at the chat, but thank you very much for your comments. Somebody asked me about Cleopatra as black and, and you're right. So obviously um, Cleopatra is referred to as having this tawny front and, um, but Dickinson doesn't seem to refer to that as far as I know. And, and, and you know, maybe, maybe somebody else would know better and, and correct me. But so, so this is a question from uh, Patrick Jackson. Um, so as far as I know, no. Um, and I think Cleopatra was already so controversial that to include race in the equation might have just kind of blown everything out of all proportion. Um, but um, but I'm I'm not aware of that. I mean, uh, the recent um, RSC production uh, from uh, 2017 has um, a black actress play 
Cleopatra and it's absolutely wonderful. So that that would be all I, I know.